Hello everybody, Jerry here aka Mathosphere and welcome back to Cross Stitch Time. Today I have something to show you. I've made a discovery. Well actually I made two. One that led into the other. The first discovery I found, I was poking around some old magazines, you know, for my own purposes, and I discovered this one. This is Cross Stitcher Magazine issue 24, dated November 1994. The cover writes, nicest Christmas stuff, ornaments and whatever, uh, very evergreen, but at the bottom you will notice a very intriguing tagline. Computerized cross stitch. Create professional looking charts more easily. Now to my mind that was irresistible. So as soon as I saw that, I hopped over to eBay, snagged me a copy of this, and let me tell you, this article does not disappoint. Okay, the magazine does disappoint a little bit. Um, because actually half of the article is missing from my copy. I have one page and then it skips up to the adverts. It's missing a couple other pages as well. And also whoever did it, like, cut out the crossword. Uh, but that's a me problem. That's not a you problem. The half that is here is awesome. Check this out. Once you've installed your software and started it running, you will find that most of the screen is taken up by a grid. This is for your designs. You'll also find a palette of colors and probably line up buttons with pictures on them, representing various tools and stitches. Almost everything is done using the mouse. In a computing context, a mouse is a device that you push around your desk in order to move a pointer around the screen. It has one more buttons which you click to make things happen. <laughs> Dropping a little tech wisdom on you guys today. In case you didn't know that's what a mouse was, now you do. Now, when I got this, I was interested in it mostly for novelty purposes. I love reading about this kind of stuff. I was a little wee baby in 1994, so everything it mentions is very, very nostalgic to me. But that wasn't actually the only thing that ended up being the movie. The half of the article that I have, the page that has survived, includes a list of four programs that they tested out in order to write it. Cross Stitch Master Elite, Cross Stitch Master Professional, X Stitch Designer and X Stitch Designer Gold Premium Plus. Note that last one cost 399 pounds and 99, what's it called, pence? And that's like, the, so 400, 400 pounds in like 1994 dollars, which is insane to me. I'm pretty sure in 1994 you have to mortgage your house to get that kind of money. The publishers of those programs are also mentioned. Those last two by Illsoft, you've never heard of. And then the first two by Ursa Software. And Ursa Software, I know them. Uh, if you ever designed programs, there's a chance you might have used their stuff. They're actually one of the, kind of one of the big names in cross-stitch software, you know, such, as, such as it is. If you've ever used WinStitch, and if you've ever used MacStitch, those are both made by Ursa Software. Uh, and when I say Ursa Software, they're like a little husband and wife duo, Jeff and Debs Tallinn. They make good stuff. I really like WinStitch. Quality program, that. As soon as I knew that there were these other programs out there, though, well, I had to have them. And I got them. And I'm going to show them to you. Now, the stuff from Illsoft. Uh, I looked for it, tried to find it. No luck. I'm not really surprised at that price point. I can't imagine there's anybody on the planet who, who ever bought it. But the Ursa software ones, Cross Stitch Master, that I did find. As for how I got it, um, that's a story for another day. Basically, nobody has it. Can't get it on eBay, can't get it secondhand, can't get it through questionable, dubious means. You can't even get it from Jeff. I actually emailed him. Uh, he, he was super nice. He poked around in a couple drawers to see if he had any old floppies lying around. Uh, and he didn't, but he did have some manuals. Check this out. I'll post some links to the scans that he sent me. He said I could, don't worry. These are some vintage manuals for the Amiga version. But the actual program itself, no dice there. Uh, eventually I did manage to get a copy of it um, through means that I shall not be sharing here. Um, and once I actually had a copy of it and knew that something was out there and which exact version it was, I was able to poke around and find uh, where it more likely originally came from, which is the Internet Archive has a massive dump of Amiga games. If you go there, you can get Cross Stitch Master. And you can get other stuff too, you know? 
if you're interested in getting started in emulation, which I am, and we are. So let me show you the emulator. This is the third take I've tried to do of this video. My own fault, really. Uh, the first time I did it, I messed up the emulation, and the second time I really messed up the audio. But if you are keeping track at home, you will notice that that means there's nothing left that can be messed up. So, uh, third time's a charm. So the Internet Archive, they don't just have websites, print media, etc. They also preserve a lot of old software. And the file that we're looking at has been preserved by them as part of a massive dump of Amiga programs. There's upwards of 4,000 files preserved in here. We won't be looking at uh, any of the others today. Just the one. Cross Stitch Master version 3.51, circa 1992. If you've never tried to play a file from 1992 before, here's how you go about it. Step one, we're gonna need an emulator. The one we're using today is called WinUAE. Others exist, but this is the one we're gonna be trying out. When you load up WinUAE, it's not gonna be able to run things just out of the box. You're gonna to need to get some boot software. When you open it up, it will tell you what you need. Take the names of the things that you need, do a Google search, find them somewhere, download them to whichever path is listed for system ROMs. The ones that I'm using, I've got a Mega Kick 13, Kick 20, Kick 31. I just got them as a batch. The program is going to know which one it needs when you load it up. So just get what you can and then come on back. Once you've got that set up, you're going to go into Quick Start and you're going to select your image file. We want Cross Stitch Master version 3.51, that's from the Internet Archive. We want disk 1 of 2. Uh, there is disk 2 of 2. That just has more images, though. We're not going to be looking at that today. You can look at it on your own time, though. There are some secrets to discover if you go and download this yourself. So you really got to. Don't just watch me do this. You should be trying this yourself. Once we got that file selected, we're going in. I'm very excited to show you guys this stuff. Like, this is really cool to me. Check it out. <laughs> The files you're seeing right here, these are each some images that come preloaded with the software. If you take a look at them, they're all very charming. Like, check this out. Like, look at that sampler. And like the summer house, the summer house might be my favorite. The summer house reminds me a lot of the sprites from the old King's Quest games. I really like all the Commodore cursors. Like the sleepy guy, he's so cute. <laughs> the gay hand also gets big points for the gay hand. Honestly, there are things this program does right that I feel like some modern cross-stitch software doesn't even do. Like I feel like this is just the ideal cover image for a cross-stitch program, like with the border and the flowers. And you can edit it too, you can stitch this. This is the only cross-stitch program I've seen that will let you take their home screen and then view it as stitches. It's incredible. Zero notes. Like, this is peak. What we want to do, though, we want to make something new. I have an idea for what we want to make. Okay. <laughs> That's a little clock, get it? Like, that was a clock right there. Here's another thing that most modern cross-stitch software doesn't do, but a lot of modern pixel art software does. When you draw something in the main window, it'll also show it to you at different magnifications. And, if you want, you can draw in the times 2 preview window and have it pop up in the main. You can't draw in the times 1, but you can draw here. And then you can side-click to erase. If you've drawn something and you've messed up, they don't have an undo button, of course. As you see, they've got an oops button. <laughs> That's part of the big charm with these kind of older programs. So many of the things that we do with computers now have become standardized. Not a bad thing. 
But it's cool to see, you know, different takes on what the different cursor should look like. What's a loading cursor look like? Should we have an oops button or an undo button? Nowadays, you'll see those sort of things be switched up, you know, for kids' programs, for fun little novelty programs. But like, this is a, this is a practical workaday program. Can you imagine if Microsoft Excel had something that just went, oops. Okay, I do know what I actually want to draw for real, though. And what I want to draw uses some different colors in this. So let me show you what this can do. Okay, so I do want this color. I want this a little off-white. But I also want a darker gray. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this purple that I'm not going to use. And I'm going to adjust these sliders at the bottom. until I get the color that I do want. This is another feature. I think this is genius. Like, I understand why modern programs don't do this. Modern programs have it set up so that you can select from a list of either DMC colors or colors in your cross-stitch brand of choice. But even so, like, that's charming. Like, that's so cool, right? Along with that, I think I'm gonna need this red. Definitely gonna need a little black. Might warm up the gray just a little so there's a little more contrast. And you can see, like, look, it's changing in there. As I change it, it's adjusting. Very, very nice, very convenient. And I'm gonna scroll over so I have some space. Okay, so I can scroll throughout, but I start in the upper left-hand corner. So if I want to have some space to be able to go left, I need to be able to leave that there from the start. I'm not going to be able to move my picture once I get it going. That feature has not been invented yet. Another thing that this program does that I wish the modern programs would do, when you draw an X, It draws the stitch a little bit spray out. And then if you draw something next to it, watch the edge, it kind of pushes it in a little bit. So that the stitches look real nice and full if they're standing alone. But if they've got somebody next to them, they look kind of crammed together. Wheel stitches do this in real life standalone ones will kind of have more room to breathe, but if you're doing full coverage, visually they kind of smoosh each other together. It's a very subtle effect, uh, but it is a real one that shows up in cross-stitch, and I think it's really cool that this pixelite version from 92 has managed to capture that. So I'm going to draw today. Like I told you, this is my third time I'm trying this, yeah? The first time, in honor of Ursa Software, I did a little pattern with bears. And then the second time that I did it, uh, a little more fittingly, I decided that I would do panda bears. Both times that didn't exactly work out though, so this time we're going to do some polar bears. And this one's going to be Mama Polar Bear giving her little baby polar bear a tasty, tasty meal. It's going to be eating a seal. All right, then let's take it to the voiceover. As you can see, I'm keeping it simple with this pattern. My main goal when working at the scale is just for everything to be identifiable. I'm not too worried about perfect anatomical realism. I'm not interested in shading or whatnot. Yeah, and I also don't want it to be too gory. If you ever look up pictures of uh, actual polar bears eating, <laughs> it can get a little bit gory, which is not really what I'm going for here. This isn't trying to be some kind of gross out piece. I will keep the blood in though. It's, it's accurate and I like the color of it. Another big concern, I do want the composition to be balanced. You're gonna see me try and fill the space over here with, uh, I'm going for like an Arctic hair, which does fill the space and works thematically, but it doesn't end up looking very much like a hair at all. So I'm gonna take it out in a second, replace it with just a snow covered rock. Getting it centered with this program is a challenge. 
even with the three different windows, you can't really see the design as a whole without exiting out to the main screen, uh, which is what you see I'm doing multiple times. In the end, though, I'm able to shovel stuff around, get it to where it needs to be. Huh? That ends up looking all right, I reckon. Okay, I think it's done. All I have to do then is I'm going to save it as poor. Hit enter and select. It'll take it a second, but it's done. Now, for all that the speed of this compares to like modern cross designing software, or have you ever done pixel art or digital art, you know how fast those modern programs can be. This is still a massive step up from designing on grid paper. If you were switching between different colored pencils, like you can do that. You can use colored pencils pretty well, but you have to, you know, you have to shade in each box one by one. That is more work than just a single click at a time. And then traditionally after that, you would then have to make your chart with all of your symbols. And this is actually going to make it for you. Now that we're done with it, we're going to print it. Now, I've already done some of the preliminary stuff to set up the printing. You need a printer now running up. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hit F12. What I did is I went into IO ports, and then I'm going to set it up to print to this printer here. And I'm going to tell it to emulate it as an Epson matrix printer. There are some other methods that people say will work a little bit better. Uh, but this is the only one that I was able to get working with me and with the printer that I've got here. So I'm going to use the emulator there. And then I'm going to choose the area I want to print. You'll notice... Oh, there we go. <laughs> Excuse me for a second. Uh, <laughs> you'll notice this is a massive area. You don't really get to choose your canvas size. So what you'll just do is you will select... There we go. That's the area I want to print. Tell it to print selected area. Oh, and I haven't named the colors. Wait, I gotta name the colors. Okay, I'm gonna do that first. Okay, for my colors, I got my boxes here. I'm gonna hit name thread colors, and then I know which ones I used. I used off white. Oh, this is perfect. Okay, I'm gonna use DMC01 for the off white. So, DMC01. And then I also used, I did use red. Let's see if this works. This is the part I have to wait for. Now the printing is going to take a while. We won't rush it. We'll just give it its time. When it's done, it's done. Oh, 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 it's work. Okay, um, yes, ready. And it's going, okay, it's going. One pattern page and one key. I really like the little symbols. They're quite charming. And my guess is, my guess is that's part of the reason it's like a built-in palette, right? My guess is that there is exactly one symbol for each of the different color editable squares that you can choose to put in your palette. It's quite charming. It's easy to read. It doesn't have any of, you know, the bells and whistles, no center guidelines, no count, you know, none of those 10 by 10 lines. I mean, you don't need that stuff. This is what you need. Okay, so I am going to stitch this. But before I do, I'm going to try and export it as a PDF as well. Back into F12. This time, I'm going to tell it to print to PDF, and I'm just going to save it on my hard drive. All right, before I go, let me show you the other patterns that I made before. I got two other bears. 
This one is the regular brown bear, the grizzly bear. You'll see them catching the salmon, the little beehive nearby for them to enjoy later on. And these right here would be my little panda bears. You see this one, the little red pandas hanging out with them too. Uh, I'm going to stitch all of these and then if you would like to, I'm also going to put the PDFs up. I'll just put them on my Kofi. That's where I put all the little weird stuff, the little free patterns and things. So if you'd like to check them out, print them off yourself, enjoy a little faux vintage pattern of your own, I'll put them up there. I'll also post a link to the emulator, I'll post a link to the ROM on the internet archive, I'll post a link to the scans that Jeff got for me, and I'll post a link to where you can buy Jeff and Deb's software today. Massive thank you, Jeff, if you are watching this, and I will send it to you. I said I would. Uh, if you've watched it all the way through, thank you. Thank you so much for making this software. Uh, this is really cool. I enjoyed poking around, having a little fun getting it to work. It really is incredible. and I love that you've been maintaining it for so, so long. Thank you. You've made a lot of beautiful patterns possible. I appreciate that. All the best to both of you. And all the best to everybody watching. Have a good one, and I'll see you next time. Update time. Stitching complete. I changed a bunch of stuff with these guys as I was stitching them. Moved some elements around, changed some of the thread colors. And all in all, I'm really happy with them. Polar bear is probably my favorite, uh, though I really like the way the red pandas turned out as well. If you want to grab a pattern, it's free, or pay what you want if you'd like, on my Kofi. It was a lot of fun to make them, especially to try a new program for the first time. Hope you guys had fun watching. I got one more video I want to knock out before year's end, so with any luck, see you soon.